This was meant to be one video going over China's infamous censorship rules and how MiHoYo has intentionally worked around them to tell a story including topics usually banned from the general Chinese public. But the script got so long, it's now two videos. This first video will go over the new video game regulations rolled out in 2021 and the ways MiHoYo has ignored those rules. While the second video will be going over specific quests that cover topics usually censored by the CCP. Be sure to follow so you know when the second video comes out. For this video, when discussing the Chinese Communist Party, I'm going to be shorting it to the CCP. The translation of this PowerPoint was provided by an English game news site that I'll link below. If part of the translation is wrong, I have no way of knowing it. The only policies I'm positive of are the ones updated because of MiHoYo. Yes, we will get to Venti. And that one has been translated and discussed on other forum sources, so I feel more confident about that slide. But let's get started. First up, China's history of game censorship. China, like most first world countries, has its own game ratings board. All games sold online or physically in mainland China have to be approved by this board. But unlike other countries that have E, teen, and mature ratings, China only has one, approved by the CCP, which means no blood, nudity, extreme violence, or crime in the game. Basically around an E rating. You either get approved or you don't. Even though China has some of the strictest minor gaming laws on the globe, which would make it easy to make an adults only gaming category. But China doesn't want to even let their adults be allowed to see blood or violence. But I'm not here to explain the logic behind these rules, which is good because because for the life of me, I can't understand the logic of most of these. I can just clearly see when MiHoYo includes something on the list of banned things, and so I'm going to go over those in this video. Of course, there are places where MiHoYo has followed Chinese censorship and laws, and the list is quite short, so I'll go over them here. MiHoYo's co-op chat and HoYoLab posts both filter and star banned words. This has been the case since launch and isn't new information. When China released its three hours a week gaming limits for minors, MiHoYo also complied and added a way for minor accounts in China servers to only work for those three hours. The censorship board also apparently got complaints about Jean, Amber, Mona, and Rosario's outfits back in 2021, and MiHoYo reworked the designs to show less skin and made the new version not optional on China servers. All other servers can still switch back and forth. I still have Rosario's old outfit, for example. But other than that, MiHoYo has not made any adjustments to the game to comply with Chinese censorship regulations. Genshin Impact had to go through approval when it was first launched in 1.0. Jean, Amber, and Mona's designs were available for 1.0 and approved originally, meaning the board could require MiHoYo to change, remove, or not add more things that break the rules, and they just haven't. Which is interesting when you realize just how many things MiHoYo is getting away with. So what's actually banned from games released in China? I'm going to be referencing slides from an internal training course covering the new regulations for games released in China. It was aimed at Chinese game developers, so it's not just foreign games trying to get released into the country that need to follow these rules. MiHoYo's team is well aware of these rules, is called out during one of the rules, and yet still breaks multiple rules on the list. <laughs> First off, no blood and no pornography slash nudity. Okay, easy enough. Genshin has neither. No mentions of Tibet, the Dalai Lama, Hong Kong, and other sensitive real-world events. Alright, as mentioned, they just banned those words in co-op. Can't say them, it's fine. And it's a fantasy world, so none of those places exist. Alright, here we go. No barbarian-style enemies, no demons as allies, no misuse of religious symbols, no pushing players towards gotchas, no vague morality or gray morality main characters, no Japanese anime style, no gay men, no queer baiting, no effeminate men, no men with ponytails and earrings, no use of the words killing, died, or shot, no violent character classes like assassin, hitman, or pirate, no taverns or drinking, no smoking, specifically women holding pipes, no ascending to godhood, no character RNG, and my personal favorite, no loot boxes. Very illegal. It should not surprise you when I tell you that Genshin has broke every single one of these rules. Now, not all of these rules existed back when Genshin was first trying to be approved. The feminine men rule was created because of Genshin, which is the one we'll break down first. The Venti ban. This, this right here, is the funniest image of all time to me. Proof from an in-company board meeting that Venti is largely responsible for the twink ban, or as I lovingly call it, the Venti ban. <laughs> now what is the Venti ban? I summarized it as no effeminate men, but what does that mean? It means no soft boys. No soft boys so soft you can cast a female voice actor to voice them. So soft at first glance you can't tell if they're a boy or a girl or not. It also means no makeup or ponytails, which is Zhao and Song Li. Wait, what? Context. So this law was not completely Venti's fault. It was also Chinese pop boy band's fault. You see, a few months before, the ruler requiring more masculine men came out for television, at which point some boy band stars had their ponytails and ear piercings of all things censored. Warning for uh, misogyny? 
like a lot of misogyny. The Chinese government didn't like all the women who found softer, more gentle men appealing. They worried men would soften themselves to be more appealing and it would weaken China as a whole. They wanted Chinese media to only depict strong masculine men as the perfect communist ideal of a man. So it was inevitable the rule would come to video games. So that means no more Venti, right? Yes. Use him as little as possible or change his design. And no new male characters like Fenty? New male characters need to be more masculine. And when did these new rules come into play? Immediately, November 2021. Also, femboy characters have been released since Goro, who is also in the slide. So December 2021 was Goro's release. Heizo, July 2022. Mika, March 2023. Kave, May 2023. Lenny, August 2023. And Fermine, September 2023. <sighs> I don't know what we were expecting. At least that's what it looks like from the outside. The new restrictions came in November 2021, but nothing has been changed or held back because of the new rules. The new outfits I mentioned earlier? Yeah, those came out two updates after these new rules. If they wanted to redesign Venti and release it with the female new skins, they could have, but they didn't. And so it's safe to assume they weren't told to. Lenny's design was revealed in the Nations trailer way back when Genshin first launched. People were worried this rule would force them to redesign him, but his design is nearly identical to what was used. Or say, oh, Lenny doesn't look that gay. One, he's wearing a corset. That is a corset. And two, South Korea fans called for a redesign because they felt he looked too gay. Also, he gives Traveler a romance rose at the end of his character quest, regardless of if you're the female or male Traveler. So yeah. Miyoyo has also pushed back on the rule against queer content, or boy love, as labeled in this memo. Honkai Impact 3rd had a canon kiss of two lesbian characters. And the best friends requirement was for translated content that had characters as boyfriends in the original. But Miyoyo has used this as a loophole to push two characters as close together as possible and then say, they're just friends, they're just roommates. Look. Other Genshin creators have already gone in depth about all the queer subtext in Genshin. I'll link below if you want to check out some of these videos because we'd be here all day if I explained all the ways Mihoyo has been and straight up broken the no gays rule. Spoilers. There's gay characters in Genshin. They exist. Seems that as long as Mihoyo keeps releasing all Hathams and Nevelettes, the CCP won't care if there's one Heizo or Mika in the pile too. And as long as Mihoyo has, they're just friends, is an excuse for every queer ship, the CCP doesn't seem to require them to remove anything. Also, the forced redesign of the four female characters has not caused Mihoyo to hold back in the slightest. Do you know what was released in 2.4? Ningguan's lantern right outfit. The one where if you run, yeah, it looks like there's no panties to take a shot of. How did this get okayed? <laughs> this outfit is still in the game. Folks feared characters like Lisa or Raiden would have forced reskins as well, but they never came. Other than Shinha losing her belly button, apparently. So after two years of the new restrictions, I think it's safe to say your favorite femboys and sexy waifus are safe. They would have redesigned them by now if they were going to. Which I guess makes it not surprising me, Hoyo has ignored basically all the other restrictions listed in this memo. But let's quickly go over a few of the other restrictions me, Hoyo has worked around or ignored from this PowerPoint. No games that look more Japanese than real Japanese games. AKA no Japanese anime style. Genshin to people in the West is assumed to be a Japanese game. So it has to be breaking this rule, right? Not completely. What the CCP was actually more concerned about was Chinese or Japanese games being dubbed in Japanese and submitted for review without Chinese subtitles in order to try and sneak some subject matter past the board. Which leads to the fun PowerPoint footnote of we experts know Japanese. Don't think we don't understand that. Genshin is dubbed in Chinese first, so it doesn't fall under this category. The other concern was historical inaccuracy, like Japanese style armor in a Chinese style era. They don't want to confuse the children. What if the children think samurai were fighting the Huns in the Three Kingdoms era? Again, Genshin keeps cultural designs locked to specific nations. No one from Inazuma is wearing Liyue armor, and no one from Liyue is wearing Inazuma armor. Ayaka in the Fontaine dress is the only one, and they constantly specify that it's a costume, and spelling out that it's not something women from Inazuma would traditionally wear. Basically putting up a big red sign yelling, not historically accurate, do not think this is how history works. Quick note, the most recent fungi event actually bends this rule for the first time. When we first meet these two NPCs, they're wearing their respective nation's outfits. But then in this most recent event, I'm gonna say it's Hana and it's gonna be wrong, I'm sorry. But in this most recent event, Hana is wearing a Fontaine outfit and Sokua now wears a Sumeru Aramite's outfit. This is the first time NPCs have completely changed outfits from one event to the next and confirms fashions being restricted to NPCs of their specific nation isn't a hard set rule. Next one. No barbarian enemies. Barbarian is categorized as outsider believed to be inferior to the native group. Games encouraging players to destroy barbarian camps is 
bad. It encourages colonization and lacks our moral standard anyway. Uh, Hilly Troll is literally the first enemy you see in the game. And you say, oh, it's fine. They're monsters. First of all, they used to be humans and base their settlements on what they remember of being human. So inferior human settlements. And second, well, the Aramites would like to have a word with you. The Aramites unfortunately show a lot of the tribal people stereotypes that are also tossed on barbarians. They may be natives of the desert, but there's no denying the ostracization and the straight out racism they experience when entering the rainforest region of Sumeru and the other nations. This game has barbarian style enemies and they are aggressive with the player usually having to wipe out the entire camp if one is alerted. Which always makes me feel bad. I'm interrupting their game of dual monsters, man. I don't want to interrupt their game. No vague morality or gray morality main character. Traveler makes some choices. In the first 30 minutes of the game, we break into a religious building and steal a sacred artifact. And the questionable moral decisions just escalate from there, like helping Jed murder an entire tribe of Aramites. You could argue those decisions are set by the story and no matter what text lines you pick, the traveler ends up completing the same actions, but that actually makes it worse because there's another rule later on that says games shouldn't give a player a choice between two bad options. There should always be a morally right answer. Star Rail goes even farther into the gray morality, with text options that let you skip the whole quest if you decide you don't want to help the person. Traveler and Trailblazer are firmly in the morally gray category. Just because their actions end up resulting in the right thing by the end doesn't change the morally gray choices they pick in the moment, with no guarantee they will work. Anyway, next one! No classes or roles based around assassins, hitmen, or pirates. Basically no jobs that encourage the assault of other human beings. You don't pick your class like a standard RPG, but you can get characters like Beto, Dea, Child, Sino, and soon Chlorant. They are all mercs for hire that sometimes work with their local governments. I know some might argue Sino's inclusion, but his job is literally to hunt people down and drag them back for trial. Definition of a bounty hunter. He's not technically a mercenary like Dea, but that's only because he's permanently hired by the academia to bring in anyone they place on the bounty list. Child is just a soldier, but his whole mission in Leoe was to assassinate Rex Lapis and steal government secrets. Beto is literally a pirate. Even if she acts more like a mob boss and treasure hunter, she's still a pirate and does illegal things. <laughs> Lorraine's more complicated because she's basically a gladiator that also qualifies as a hitman, which is someone hired to kill someone else. Lorraine's one job in the arena is to not let the other person leave alive because that means she's dead. So that qualifies as being hired to kill another person right? And if the restriction is on the protagonist not being allowed to have these roles or participate in these acts, then Mihoyo still breaks the rule because Traveler has been a pirate, mercenary, and bounty hunter in various quests. No use of the word killing, died, or shot. Risley literally ends his quest telling us he murdered his parents. One of the trials is about a serial killer and 4.2 ends with the Hydro Archon being sentenced to death and then goes through with that execution. Not to mention the countless ghosts and tragic deaths we learn about throughout the series. We just ended at an event where an eight-year-old hallucinated so badly he committed suicide and drove his mother insane. Again, I don't know Mandarin, but I highly doubt they managed to avoid the word killing or died in these quests. NPCs die in Genshin all the time, and Mihoyo doesn't shy away from that fact. Some of us are still sad about Tefe, okay? But anyway, uh, no smoking. Specifically the stereotype of a strong businesswoman smoking a pipe. Not only does Ningguan smoke in official art, she has a real world statue you can buy that has her smoking. I can go and buy it right now. It's official Mihoyo merch. Sold in China. No taverns or drinking. There was an entire tavern event minigame. And even though we weren't allowed to add alcohol, we still learned how to mix drinks, not to mention the multiple characters that have been seen drunk in the story. Venti specifically, of course, but NPCs as well. Heck, the TCG stuff takes place in a kitty cafe that serves alcohol. Diona's only character trait is trying to make the grossest alcoholic drink possible and failing. And next, no tattoos. Which I find funny because the character with the large shoulder tattoo is from Leo A. Looking at you, Zhao. But Yoimiya, Kiara, possibly Fischl, and some Inazuma enemies also have tattoos. Also, I know people will say, what about Nilu? But that's henna, so not a permanent tattoo. Next up, no gotchas. Specifically, no pay to win games that can't be played without spending a lot on loot boxes. Kenshin can be played and completed without spending a cent. Also, this was aimed at foreign gotchas, specifically with loot boxes. Though I do personally feel like banner wishes don't count as loot boxes only because no box is opened. Otherwise, they fall under the definition of a loot box to me. Though selling loot box might mean one player being able to sell a loot box to another player. Basically, Team Fortress 2, no character stat RNG. Uh, well, Genshin gets around this by having it be artifacts with RNG, and yet the RNG still sucks. Do wish we got rid of the RNG. <laughs> 
And last one. The one Genshin breaks in its freaking name. No ascending to godhood. Genshin translates to candidate god. Someone with the potential to become a god. Fenty explains anyone with a vision is an allergen and they have the ability to one day become a god. The legend of Vanessa ends with her ascending to Celestia and gaining godhood. Traveler's goal along with finding their sibling is also to regain their godly powers stolen by the heavenly principles. Meaning the happy ending would be the player ascending to godhood. AKA something forbidden. So how is Miho getting away with breaking all of these rules. A lot of them have been in the game since 1.0, like Venti or the Tavern or Xiao's tattoos. But other than the four that had actual complaints sent in to the censorship board, no actual changes have been made. Even though Venti and Goru were used as examples of what the CCP no longer wanted to allow in China. Well, the answer is actually pretty easy. The CCP sees Genshin as a propaganda golden goose and so allows the game to bend some of the smaller rules. Genshin has been praised as a way to share traditional Chinese culture with the foreign market. That's why Lantern right aka Chinese New Year's, is the only holiday celebrated in sync with the real world counterpart. It's why MiHoYo's YouTube has traditional artists commissioned to do Genshin themed pieces. The most recent one was egg carving. But before you freak out, none of it is communist good propaganda. It's literally just sharing different masters of their craft, creating art, and sharing how old some of these art forms are. And that's all the CCP currently wants from Genshin, for it to show off the good artistic side of Chinese culture. They want to change the global first thought about China from, oh, China equal communist, communist equal bad, to, oh, China equal fancy traditional art, traditional art forms that go back hundreds of years. That's cool. It's propaganda in the sense of directing your attention away from the problems with the CCP and its policies, but it's not trying to sneakily convince you to support the CCP or communism. And if you think, oh, I'm never playing a MiHoYo game again now that I know that it has propaganda in it, well then I have unfortunate news for you about uh, Call of Duty, Battlefield, and Halo. And you know how they're all very aggressively pro-American military propaganda. Like, used by the military to hire future soldiers. Levels of military propaganda. Games contain the views and opinions of the creators, even if the CCP wishes that they didn't. I don't doubt Genshin creators love Chinese culture and wanted to make sure to highlight it with Liyue, which just so happened to align with the party's foreign policy goals. But I also have no doubt they love mini culture and are using Genshin as a way to share usually taboo topics and cultures with the Chinese people. And the popularity and financial success of the game is what allows them to continue to share these topics. So if you like the stories Genshin tells, keep playing Genshin. And when Lantern Ride 2024 comes around, don't complain. Just understand that it's the counterbalance that allows stories like the 4.2 Archon Quest to be told. So did you enjoy this breakdown of Chinese video game censorship? If so, please leave a like! And be sure to check out the second video in the series when I go more in depth on the risky topics MiHoYo hid in its game. It's going to discuss religion, ethics, capitalism, human rights, and mental health, along with sourcing which quests go over these topics so you can check them out for yourselves. Also, a bonus fact before you like and subscribe. According to the memo, a game is considered incomplete if it lacks descriptions of in-game world backgrounds, characters, and gear. Is, is that why we can read a description about every light post in Star Rail? And why some of those descriptions are very passive aggressive? Because if so, that's freaking hilarious. But anyway, see you next time. Bye!